I'm going to talk about the microneurosurgical anatomy about the ventricular system. First, this slide shows the most easy way to prepare the brain. It's called sectional anatomy. You just take the brain and make sections. This was made uh, axial cuts uh, on the brain. And what everybody can see, can notice, is that the brain has cavities inside it. It has, uh, we call it ventricular cavities. It has a lateral ventricular cavity, one in each hemisphere, I'm showing here. And then it has two median uh, cavities, a third, uh, third ventricle here between both thalami, and uh, um, the fourth ventricle here at the posterior fossa between the pons anteriorly and uh, the cerebellum posteriorly. Uh, although this is the easier way to see the cavities, to identify the cavities, it's not really easy to see how they are uh, uh, together and how uh, and all its anatomy. So let's go to the 3D. If everybody uh, please put uh, the glasses, the 3D glasses on. So this is a superior view. We, uh, we have a brain, we made an axial cut and removed its top. And we can see both uh, lateral ventricle, one on each side, both separated uh, by this medial uh, layer, this medial structure. This is the septum pellucidum, uh, right uh, um, uh, on the sagittal plane. Um, we can see the lateral ventricles, one on each side of the septum pellucidum. This is a medial view where we see uh, uh, the medial cortex, the medial surface of the brain, and then we notice this, uh, uh, the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the, is the thicker uh, um, bundle of commissural fibers that the, the mammals have, and of course we have, uh, we have a two, and it's separated uh, into segments. We have a hostrum here, we have a genu or knee of the corpus callosum. Then we have the trunk or body of the corpus callosum and then the splenar here. What we can see is that um, the corpus callosum will wrap around most of the lateral ventricle and will make uh, uh, its, 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 uh, 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 its, its boundaries. We can also see on, its, uh, on this uh, dissection here how the lateral ventricle will drain into the third ventricle. The third ventricle is a median cavity located between both thalami, and between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle, we'll have this, this foramen here, is the foramen of Monroe, that is actually uh, an, an, one enlargement of the choroidal fissure that we'll come to this later. And from here, the CSF the, can come from the lateral ventricle uh, towards uh, the, the third ventricle. And then from the third ventricle, through the mesencephalon, the CSF will get into the fourth ventricle. This pathway is through the acudate, the mesencephalic acudate, or the acudate of Silvius, located at the posterior part of the mesencephalon. Then the CSF will get inside um, the fourth ventricle and will exit the fourth ventricle to, through three foramina, um, one on each side called Lushica, and one on the middle aspect is called the margin D. And then CSF will, uh, uh, will, be, uh, will get inside the subarachnoid space and later on uh, uh, be uh, drained through the, um, uh, uh, through the veins and back to the, to the vascular system. Here is a superior view already showed in the first, in the first uh, uh, lecture, how it's interesting that the insular surface is, is, the, is, the, is the lateral aspect of the central core and the lateral ventricular cavity also make this C shape around the central core, particularly uh, over the thalamus. And uh, according to the thalamus, this lateral ventricular cavity, it can be separated into segments, into horns. So anterior to the, to the thalamus, we'll have the anterior or frontal horn. Superior to the thalamus, we'll have the body of the ventricle. Posterior to the thalamus, we have the atrium. Then the posterior horn or occipital horn will be an ex a posterior extension of the atrium. And inferior to the thalamus, we have the inferior horn or temporal horn. Um, of course, inside, uh, inside the lateral ventricle, we'll find this membrane here. This is the plexus, this is the choroid plexus. Superiorly, uh, we are seeing here 
the septum pellucidum medially, the thalamus here, and in relation to the thalamus, as I mentioned, anteriorly we have the frontal horn, and uh, over we have the body, and posterior we have the atrium. What is nice to see here is that uh, uh, the choroid plexus is attached to the choroidal fissure, and this fissure will be present between what is medially, the, the fornix, and what is laterally, the, the thalamus. It's actually called the lamina affixa of the thalamus because the old anatomist would say that uh, uh, the telencephalon fixates itself over the diencephalon at that place, that's what's called lamina fixa, but it's really the superior aspect of, of the thalamus. And so between the thalamus and the fornix, we'll have the, uh, the choroidal fissure and at the choroidal fissure, we'll have the choroid plexus attached to it. What happens that at the anterior horn, there's no choroidal fissure and will not have choroid plexus. And that is why uh, we aim to position uh, 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 an external ventricular drainage, for example, at the uh, frontal horn. This is a rotten, uh, uh, this is a Professor Rotten slide. Um, that he landed to me is just uh, to show the anterior horn here and uh, what is on each, uh, what structure is on each uh, uh, surface of the anterior horn. Laterally, we have uh, the head of the caudin nucleus, anteriorly, we have uh, the genu, and inferiorly, the genu of the corpus callosum, and inferiorly, we have the hostrum of the corpus callosum. And then we have one on each side the foramen row. There's really a detachment, an enlargement of the choroidal fissure. We'll see it later. And we'll uh, give the CSF uh, a, a route to the third ventricle. And between both, uh, uh, both uh, lateral, lateral ventricular cavities, we have the septum pellucidum. We also have between the thalamus and the caudine nucleus, we have the thalamus trite vein. The thalamus trite vein will progress medially and open into and, 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 and merge with the anterior septal vein to form the internal cerebral vein, which uh, usually is this connection is already inside the interpositum system. That's the roof of the third ventricle. We'll come back to it. This is a more uh, uh, far away view where you can see the body of the lateral ventricle here. The lateral aspect is the, is the body of the caudin nucleus. Medially, we have the septum pellucido. Inferiorly, we have the thalamus. And superiorly, we have the body of the corpus callosum that's superior to this slide. Um, we see the thalamus here, the fornix here, and between themselves, the choroid plexus attached to the choroidal fissure. And here at the atrium, we see the glomus of the choroid plexus. What's interesting to note here, too, is that the frontal horn and the body of the, uh, of the lateral ventricle are uh, medium structures. They are very close to the to the to midline. Uh, meanwhile, the atrium and the other compartments of the lateral ventricle they are not close to the midline. They are they are more parasagittal. They are more lateral. These will have surgical implications. They will show it later. Here we have the atrium here uh, with the glomus of the plexus choroidal here. Here we have uh, the collateral uh, trigon and which anteriorly will continue with the collateral eminence. Uh, medially, at the inferior horn, we have the hippocampus here, and then posteriorly, we have the occipital horn. Uh, here is a more uh, centered view of the temporal horn, the inferior horn, with the um, hippocampus inside it. A superior view showing the central core here and how the choroidal fissure can be easily enlarged because it's a natural cleft uh, where the uh, choroid plexus is attached. With the spatula, we'll have the, the, the fornix. So the fornix is being displaced and the uh, choroidal fissure is being enlarged. This is a surgical route uh, to the third ventricle called uh, transchoroidal approach that we're going to mention it later. So the choroidal fissure can be open uh, superiorly from inside the ventricle. It can be open superiorly to reach the, the roof of the third ventricle. It can be open posteriorly to reach the pineal region. So you can see here the pineal uh, on the center of this line. Uh, this is also a route that can be used surgically and it's also a route that uh, tumors can have and can uh, expand and go through this natural cleft. And if we open 
the choroidal fissure inferiorly will connect uh, the inferior horn to the urban system here. So uh, especially in, uh, uh, in order to resect, for example, temporomedial structures and epilepsy surgery, for example, you need to have this uh, enlargement here. What we can see also is that anterior to the uh, head of the, of the, of the hippocampus, we have the amygdala and these two structures, they are not anatomically connected together. There is a small uh, uh, um, a recess between themselves. It's called the unco recess. So it's a recess that we can see on radiological images and we can also see uh, here in anatomy as well. Another anatomical uh, relation that we have to have in mind is how close the foramen row is to the genu of the internal capsule. This is very important, especially in endoscopic approaches to the third ventricle, where the surgeon aims to go through the foramen row with the endoscope. The surgeon needs to be very correct and very precise on its approach because if he, uh, uh, if he, uh, puts the endoscope more laterally, it can harm the genu of the internal capsule and the genu of the internal capsule will carry the cortical nuclear uh, uh, fibers that will uh, give our face its movements. If the surgeon uh, goes more medially, it, uh, he can harm here the fornix. Here is where the body of the fornix is turning into the column of the fornix right anterior to the foramen row. So if, the, if he goes uh, with the endoscope more medially, he can hurt these, these structures. Uh, posteriorly, we have here the choroid plexus here and the thalamus here. Between both uh, lateral uh, ventricular cavities, we have the septum pellucidum here. The septum pellucidum is just a membrane that is uh, separating both uh, um, both uh, lateral ventricular cavities. Um, it's called uh, the false septum because uh, it's opposed to the true septum. That's the septum verum or the septal region here. The septum region, uh, I think Professor Ribas will talk about this, but it's the, uh, it's, it's this three uh, vertical disposition uh, gyri that they, that they are located just in front of the anterior commissure and just posterior to the singlet pole here, this connection of the singlet gyrus with the rectus gyrus here. So between these two regions, we have the, the septal region here. If we remove this, uh, the septum pellucidum, then we can see the lateral aspect of, in, of the ventricular uh, frontal horn and body. This is the head of the caudate and body of the caudate. Um, just to uh, draw attention to here again, here's the septal region, here's the singlet pole, here is the rostrum of the, of the corpus callosum, genu, trunk, and spleen. The foramen row is just a, one, uh, one enlargement of the choroidal fissure. And here we can see the fornix going to the mammillary body, just as Professor Ture showed uh, nicely in his uh, fiber dissection. Uh, from the foramen row to the opening of the acudit, we can see a very shallow uh, sulcus here. It's called the hypothalamic sulcus. The hypothalamic sulcus will divide the thalamus superiorly from the hypothalamus inferiorly. The the, while the thalamus is more a structure, it's an ovoid, uh, uh, well-defined structure, the hypothalamus is more like a region. It's everything which is uh, uh, inferior to this, to this uh, sulcus here. So we have the uh, uppermost part of the uh, mesencephalon, then anteriorly, we have uh, uh, um, the, the mammillary body and the tubicinarium, the infundibular, continuing with the uh, hypophysial stalk, the pituitary stalk, and then we have here uh, the chiasm, the optic chiasm. From the optic chiasm to the anterior commissure, we'll have a membrane here as the lamina terminalis. The lamina terminalis can be surgically open if the surgeon wants to connect the third ventricle with the rest of the subarachnoidal space. This is uh, a procedure which is uh, done in especially vascular surgery. It can be done, it's just a membrane here at the anterior uh, uh, part of the, of the third ventricle. We can see here the massa intermedia, which connects both thalami, one on each side. The thalamus is the lateral surface of the third ventricle. 
and the posterior aspect of the ventricle will have the epithalamus. The epithalamus is centered on the pineal, is the most important structure of the epithalamus, the pineal here, which is attached to the posterior aspect of the ventricle by two, uh, 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 by two arms, I would say. A superior one, which is connected to the abdominal commissure, and, a post and an, an inferior one, which is connected to the posterior commissure. And here, the opening of the aqueduct and its continuation to the fourth ventricle here. Um, at this space, at the superior aspect of the third ventricle, we have what is called the uh, uh, value interpositum cistern. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but the value interpositum cistern holds vascular structures, especially uh, uh, the posterior medial choroidal artery and the internal cerebral veins. So at this dissection here, we can see the internal cerebral vein here, uh, draining posteriorly, then later into the vein of Gallen. We'll talk about this later as well. Here the fourth ventricle is focused on the center of the image. We can see anteriorly the pons and posteriorly the vermis, the cerebral vermis, the cerebral vermis medially and uh, this, the cerebral hemisphere laterally. Inferiorly, we have the foramen of margin D medially, and one on each side, we have the foramen of Lushka. These are the opening of the fourth ventricle that the CSF will go from the fourth ventricle into the cerebral canodal space uh, and gain all the brain uh, surface. If we see um, uh, the floor of the, third, of the fourth ventricle, this is the homeboid uh, uh, surface, Okay, and the homeboid surface will have a longitudinal, medial, median uh, sulcus. Then we have one on each side, the facial colliculus. The facial colliculus is where uh, uh, the nucleus accumbens is being covered by the facial uh, uh, fibers, uh, from the facial nerve fibers. This is the facial colliculus, one on each side, their prominence. Lateral to the facial colliculus, we have the sulcus limitans one on each side. And then we have the, foramen, the opening of the foramen lushka here, the lateral recess opening on the other side, the calamus scriptorius and the uh, foramen of, 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 uh, of margin D would be posterior to this region here. And here we have the cerebral peduncles. The cerebral peduncles is where uh, um, is how the cerebellum is attached to the posterior aspect of the pons. We have the superior cerebral peduncle here, inferior here, and the lateral cerebral peduncle, which is the most, uh, uh, the bigger one, it is not really related to the ventricular cavity, it's more lateral to this cavity. Here's an interesting preparation where uh, someone put a catheter inside, uh, inside the ventricular cavities and, and flew the, and put inside the cavity um, a metal, but metal in this, it's uh, liquid state, it was hot, and then it got uh, uh, cold and it became solid. And, and then the brain was just uh, taken out with some acid corrosion uh, 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 protocol. And what we can see here is the metal there was inside the ventricular cavities. And we can see how the ventricular cavities are connected together. So we can see here this C-shaped, this is the lateral ventricle. Okay, so this is the anterior horn, body, atrium, occipital horn, and inferior horn. And here inferior to the, uh, to the connection between of the frontal horn and the body, we can see here how the metal got to, uh, got to the third ventricle. This connection here is the foramen monroe. CSF uh, was not present here because this is the massa intermedia, and then the aqueduct opened into the fourth ventricle. So we can see here, this is a frontal view, C, uh, the C-shaped lateral ventricles, one on each side, remember that the frontal horn and body are medial, segment, are medial compartments, but the atrium, uh, posterior and inferior horn are lateral segments of the lateral ventricle. Third ventricle and fourth ventricle are medial cavities. So I'm just gonna show a little bit of the micro, um, microneurosurgical anatomy, um, uh, trying to do some surgical approaches uh, in, in some cadaveric specimens and trying to pinpoint some special correlations, anatomic correlations. So the first is how to get, how the surgeon can get inside the frontal horn uh, 
or the body of the lateral ventricle, he would do it by an interhemispheric approach usually, because uh, as I mentioned, these cavities are close to midline. So the surgeon can gain, can open the interhemispheric fissure, do the callosotomy and get inside the frontal horn and the body of the lateral ventricle. So what the patient has, has to have in mind is how to work between these uh, gaps, these spaces between those bridging veins. As Professor Ture mentioned, um, you try uh, always not to, to cut a vein, not to coagulate a vein. You, have to, you never know what's gonna happen if you, if you, if you stop the venous drainage from, from, from a vein. So you, you, need, uh, you need to consider to spare it. So here we need to work on this space between these two bridging veins in order to gain space in the interhemispheric fissure. The vein can, uh, the cortical veins can open into the superior sagittal sinus um, into like a multitude, into several veins getting uh, into the uh, superior sagittal sinus together, or they can uh, uh, just merge into a single vein that will uh, uh, later on bridge and get inside the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, another thing to consider is not to stretch too much a vein because it can be too much fragile and, 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 and then uh, uh, bleed if you stretch too much. Here, uh, we, there's not uh, too many um, arachnoidal uh, uh, um, connections uh, between the forks and the interhemispheric uh, surface of the brain until the surgeon reaches the uh, supracallosal cistern. Then uh, he will have more, uh, um, uh, more subarachnoidal uh, uh, rami to, to cut. He will open the, super, the supracallosal uh, uh, cistern and identify uh, its vascular structures and especially uh, will identify what is the cingulate sulcus and what is the callosal surface. The callosal surface is very whitish, is very white and will, um, and will reflect uh, the, uh, the light from the microscope. At the, at the cingulate sulcus, the surgeon will locate the callosal marginal artery and on the top of the callosal surface, he will locate the pericallosal uh, arteries. So here the surgeon is just uh, seeing the uh, callosal marginal artery and here the pericallosal artery. And what he wanna do is that he wanna uh, make the callosotomy between both pericallosal arteries. Now, where will he do the callosotomy? Of course, if you have a tumor that's more anteriorly, you, you do it more anteriorly. And if you have it more posteriorly, you do it more posteriorly. But if uh, uh, the next step is to gain access to the third ventricle, you need to understand how distant, how posterior from the genu is the projection of the, of the foramen rho at the corpus callosum. So it's usually 25 millimeters, two and a half centimeters uh, posterior to the genu. So uh, he can uh, uh, see the genu and, and do this cut following these, uh, these measurements. Another thing the surgeon needs to consider when he's gaining the interhemispheric space is where is the paracentral lobule? Professor Ribas will talk about the craniometric points later, but five centimeters posterior to this point, posterior to the bragma, will have uh, uh, the paracentral lobule. And what the surgeon needs to have in mind is where the paracentral lobule is not to put his spatula over the paracentral lobule, otherwise he can harm uh, uh, the function of the legs and the patient might have a functional deficit. So he wanna put the spatula uh, uh, not at the paracentral lobule, usually more uh, anterior to it. So to locate uh, where to do the callosotomy, he will see the genu of the corpus callosum and make his cut two and a half centimeter posterior to it, a little bit more anterior, a little bit more posterior. Some people will do this cut more, more parallel. We'll claim that if you do the cut more parallel uh, uh, to the callosal fibers, it will spare more fibers, okay? This makes anatomical uh, uh, plausibility. It's, it's a way of thinking. I just made it uh, virtually, but some people will do it uh, uh, horizontally here just uh, parallel to the fibers. 
And here we'll do the callosotomy and open the, the lateral ventricle. And what we can see at the inferior uh, point of the image, we see the opening of the foramen of Moreau. Okay, so this is more uh, how the surgeon can see the lateral ventricle. The next slide is really one anatomical uh, 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 removal of all the corpus callosum just uh, for us to see what anatomy uh, the surgeon can face when he gets inside uh, the lateral ventricle. So uh, anteriorly, he will see laterally the head of the caudate, medially the, the septum pellucidum, the septum pellucidum having on its surface the anterior septal vein. And then he will see the, the, the foramen moral, posteriorly the thalamus. And then between the thalamus and the caudate, he will see the thalamus right artery, the thalamus right vein. And the connection of the thalamus right vein with the anterior septal vein will originate the anterior cerebral vein already at uh, 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 inferior to the to the to the to the fornix at the roof of the third ventricle. So, if the surgeon now wants to go to the lateral aspect of the frontal horn, he cannot do an interhemispheric approach because uh, uh, the lateral aspect is not on the middle. On the middle, uh, uh, on the middle uh, plane. So one option to reach uh, uh, the lateral aspect of the of the frontal horn, which is the head of the caudate, will be to go transfrontal, a transcortical approach through the frontal uh, 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 lobe. And Professor Ribos will mention about this too. There is also a, a point here that can be easily located. This is the connection of the. Uh, superior frontal sulcus with the precentral sulcus. It's usually a cisternal point uh, that can be easily identified during surgery. It's this point here. And the surgeon can use this point and go uh, 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 and goes uh, uh, into uh, uh, the, the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle and reach and resect uh, uh, a lesion, for example, at the head of the caudate nucleus. If the surgeon wants to reach the atrium, he can all he cannot go also through the interhemispheric fissure because, as I mentioned, the atrium is not at midline; it's a little bit more lateral. So he also needs to do a transcortical approach, now a transparietal approach, because the atrium is more posterior, of course. So if the surgeon wants to reach here, he cannot go through midline; he needs to go transparietal, and another. Uh, a point that the, that, that the surgeon can have in mind to make his, uh, uh, to position his craniotomy and to later to, uh, uh, to locate himself and to find the atrium is this connection between the intraparietal sulcus with the postcentral sulcus, which is also a point that is uh, uh, usually cisternal. So this is this point here, okay? The connection of the postcentral sulcus with the intraparietal sulcus is this point here, and if the if the surgeon goes deep at this point, he will reach the atrium. Is another way of, of reaching it. He's a professor Rotten uh, um, uh, picture as well, so he will uh, find this point here and open this point. Sorry, it's too much 3D. But if you go at this point here, that's the connection of the intraparietal sulcus with the postcentral sulcus, you will reach uh, the lateral, the, the atrium. Um, there was already mentioned uh, approaches to the temporal horn. Professor Turi said, uh, mentioned about going inferiorly through the uh, parahypocampal gyrus, but the most a traditional uh, uh, way, uh, uh, I would say, is to go transylvan, especially if the surgeon wants to reach the anterior aspect of the temporal horn, he will go transylvan. What the, what the surgeon will do is that he will split the sylvan fissure, locate the inferior limiting sulcus, and make a cut at the inferior limiting sulcus and reach the temporal horn. Remember that at this cut, he will cut the connections of the temporal uh, lobe with the frontal, with the central core, what they were mentioning before is an anatomical concept called the temporal stem. Okay, now what is the temporal stem is uh, a lot of controversies, but at this cut, we will cut these connections here that we're gonna mention a little bit later. Okay, so uh, I already sh showed some of these slides. This is the extreme capsule. 
inside the central core, and the extreme capsule, these short association fibers, they will continue uh, in, uh, underneath all the inferior limiting cell side to the opercula. So on its cut, on this cut here at the inferior limiting circuits, it will also harm some of these uh, U fibers that are connecting the opercula, the temporal operculum, with, uh, with the insular uh, gyri. But it it's, uh, has not been described any functional density by uh, making this cut at this, at this, uh, uh, at this level. Uh, but just to pinpoint, uh, uh, you are cutting some fibers there. Um, later on, a little bit more deep, you, all, you also find some of the other fibers that will uh, uh, be at this temporal stem. Anteriorly, you will have the uncinate fascicle. Uh, at the midpoint, you have the occipital frontal fascicle. And more posteriorly, you have, of course, nobody will cut here, but if you go more posteriorly towards the end of the inferior limiting circles, you have the closer cortical fibers here. So you have all these fibers that if you open uh, uh, all the insular limiting circles, you will harm. Um, more deep, a little bit more medial to the um, occipital frontal fibers, you have the anterior commissural fibers um, and posteriorly you have the calcarine, uh, the geniculo calcarine fibers. This is the visual radiation here. So if you keep yourself anteriorly at the limiting circles, it will not harm uh, visual radiation, but if you go posteriorly and open all the insulin limiting circles, you will indeed cut some of these fibers and the patient can have uh, a visual deficit, for example. Okay, and here is just opening uh, the temporal horn. Uh, we made a publication about this, uh, having in mind all these layers of the position of these fibers and how these fibers are positioned at the depth of the insulin limiting circles. And if you keep yourself more anteriorly, you will harm the uh, uncinate fascicle and part of the occipital frontal fascicle. But if you continue more posteriorly, you will get into the, into the visual radiation fibers as well. Approach to the third ventricle. Once the surgeon gets inside the lateral ventricle, he can continue and open uh, the choroidal fissure and gets inside the third ventricle. Uh, this is a nice uh, a paper from Professor Wen, and uh, you can have uh, this transchoroidal approach. So here is the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is attached to the choroidal fissure by two lamina, by two tenia. The medial one is the, is the tenia uh, uh, fornix, and the lateral one is the tenia thalami. So the, 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 the surgeon can choose to go through the tenia uh, uh, forms or through the tenia thalami in order to reach the velo interpositum cistern. The velo interpositum cistern is the roof of the third ventricle. It is made uh, 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 by, the, by a superior and inferior terra choroidea, and then uh, we'll have on its top also the fornix, and inside it we'll have some vascular structure that I mentioned, uh, the posterior medial uh, choroidal artery and the internal cerebral vein. So the transchoroidal, you can go through the tenia of fornix or to the tenia thalami. This suprachoroidal, uh, it's through the tenia fornix. So you're gonna go what is laterally the, the fornix and what is medially the, the choroid plexus. So the surgeon will cut the tenia fornices. So here I am just displacing a little bit the, um, uh, uh, the choroid plexus. We'll, we already made this cut here. So we made this cut at the tenia fornices. Is the, is, the, is the membrane between what is medially the fornix and what is laterally the choroid plexus. Um, with the spatula, we begin to displace a little bit of fornix more medially and get inside the velo interpositum. And what we find at the velo interpositum cistern, we'll find the internal cerebral veins. Internal cerebral veins will originate from the connection of the anterior caudate vein, uh, sorry, anterior septal vein with the thalamus right vein. Okay, this connection is usually close, uh, is usually near uh, the foramemoral role. Okay, both uh, veins get together and form the anterior cerebral vein, one on each side. 
Okay, so then the surgeon will work between both uh, internal cerebral veins in order to get uh, some, some uh, space between themselves, between uh, both of them. And then we'll cut uh, the most uh, deep uh, membrane of the velo interposition. This is the inferior telacoroidea, and we'll open the roof of the third ventricle. The third ventricle on its center uh, has the massa intermedia, this connection of both uh, telamai. Uh, if he uh, angles the microscope more anteriorly, he can see the hypothalamus here. So he can see uh, uh, how the uh, um, uh, mammillary bodies uh, bulge inside uh, the third ventricle and anteriorly he will see uh, the tuber scenario, for example. He can cut, if he wants, the massa intermedia to gain space and to, to see the floor, the rest of the floor of the third ventricle. If he bends uh, the microscope more posteriorly, he will see the opening of the fourth ventricle, which is described by this uh, arrow point. It has this triangular shape, the opening of the acadet. If he wants to gain more anterior space, he can cut this vein here. This is the anterior septal vein. There's no major problem in cutting this vein. So if he wants to have access to the anterior part of the third ventricle, going through the tenia uh, fornici, he, will, he can cut this vein. Now let's compare with the subcoroidal approach. The subcoroidal approach, the, the surgeon will not go through the tenia fornices. He will go through the tenia thalami. So he will go lateral to the choroid plexus, between the choroid plexus laterally and the thalamus medially. So here the surgeon is uh, displacing uh, uh, the choroid plexus medially uh, facing the thalamus here and made this cut lateral to the choroid plexus. Now, we are reaching the, also the roof of the third ventricle, but if the surgeon now wants to gain a, a space more interior and see the hypothalamus, for example, now he needs to cut this vein here, and this vein is the thalamus right vein, and it will have consequence because it will drain all this region here, the thalamus and the caudate nucleus, and he will not do so. So if he, if he wants to go transcoroidal, he needs to go medial to the choroid plexus and not lateral to the choroid plexus. Okay, some other images here. If he wants to go at this point here, uh, he will have to cut the thalamus right to vein here. Okay, and here is just to compare both strategies. So if he goes laterally, he will open this space here, lateral to the uh, internal cerebral vein. And uh, uh, maybe if he wants to uh, see the hypothalamus, he will have to cut these, ve these veins here, the thalamus right vein. Uh, on the other hand, if he goes medially, uh, uh, medial to the choroid uh, plexus, and then medial to the ipsilateral internal cerebral vein, he will go between both internal cerebral veins and reach the, the real uh, top of the roof of the third ventricle. And if he wants to gain space more anteriorly, he will cut the anterior cerebral vein, the anterior septal vein, which does not have uh, major consequences. Okay, just to pinpoint. Another option is to go interfornicio. Some people will have a cavum uh, of septum pellucidum, that's a, a natural split of both uh, 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 septum pellucidum membranes. Uh, in other times, you can you can just uh, make this separation. You can get inside uh, uh, the septum pellucidum and try to identify uh, the membranes and disposition them, one for each side, and then go more deep and try to see the space between both furnaces. And then just open this space between both furnaces. This space will lead the surgeon directly to the top of the roof of the third ventricle between both internal cerebral veins. Of course, you are dealing with both fornices and you, uh, uh, you can't harm both fornices. So this is uh, uh, a surgical strategy that the surgeon needs to be uh, very uh, uh, aware that he's working with both uh, fornices. Okay, just to see the interfornicial approach here between both internal cerebral veins uh, and he can also cut the massa intermedia and see all the floor of the third ventricle. It's a nice approach. It's, it will uh, uh, see a, a lot of, uh, of, the, of the third ventricle. He can also go posteriorly through the suprapineal space. So if a lesion is located at the posterior part, uh, 
of the third ventricle, he can go supracerebellar and then suprapineal and get uh, inside the third ventricle. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, these vessels on the next uh, uh, lecture, but the patient will go infra, uh, sorry, the surgeon will go infratentorial, supracerebellar, will locate all these veins, will locate the pineal here, and will uh, enter the third ventricle superior to the pineal gland. So he will go superior to the pineal uh, gland. Uh, what I am displacing with this uh, dissector here is the internal cerebral vein. So, uh, of course, he has to uh, maintain this vein. Okay, so the pineal here, and he will make this opening uh, superior to the pineal and reach uh, the posterior part of the third ventricle. Now, for the fourth ventricle, I'm going to talk a little bit about the televelar approach. The televelar approach is about uh, opening the fourth ventricle through uh, uh, connecting the foramen marginidia, the foramen, and the foramen of Lushka by uh, cutting the telovelar membrane. That is the, the superior uh, telochoroidea and the inferior telochoroidea. And we are going to talk, uh, we are going to, uh, 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 we are going to go through the <laughs> inferior one. Okay, so at the, at the center, we have the foramen margin D and the foramen of Lushka on, on, on the lateral side, and we'll have a membrane uh, on the top of this region here. And this, uh, at this telovelar approach, we are gonna cut this membrane here to gain access to the floor of the third ventricle, that's the homoid uh, cistern. So here, the cadaver, we are seeing uh, the posterior part of the cadaver. Here's the cerebellar uh, uh, hemispheres, one on each side, is the cerebral vermis, on the on uh, at midline here we put uh, we just displaced one tonsilla for each side and we can see here the foramen of margin d okay now we located the vertebral artery and its first uh, main branch this is the pica the posterior inferior cerebral uh, cerebellar artery we need to locate this vessel, this uh, big artery, in order to safeguard it. And uh, we displace it laterally to expose the inferior telechoroidea and, um, and, and the inferior vellum here. The foramen lushka will be on this side, and this membrane can be cut. Okay? Might have small vessels here, small arteries, they can be uh, cut as well. So here I made this cut connecting the foramen margin D to the foramen lushka, cutting this uh, telovelar membrane. And here we can see the longitudinal medial uh, 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 sulcus of the homboid uh, uh, fossa. We can see uh, the facial nucleus here, the facial uh, colliculus here, sulcus limitans here, and the stereo medullaris here. Okay, this is the opening of the, of the foramen lushka, the homboid lip, just have a more, a more lateral view. Uh, perhaps to have this uh, lateral view, you might need to reset the tonsilla, which is uh, okay to do it. And if you angle your microscope uh, more superiorly, uh, you might see uh, uh, the superior most part of the fourth ventricle. At this uh, uh, approach, you will get uh, in touch with the um, with the pica and you need to remember that it has its loops and its segments. It has one anterior medullary segment, uh, a, a lateral one, and then it will get at this space lateral to the, uh, to the, to the, to the vermis that I'm going to talk about in my next lecture. Okay. <laughs>